stand up. Preparing to live stream the meeting. The meeting is now live. Just a check. Preparing to mute. Sorry, everyone. Give me one moment. Just a check. All right. Good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Stan Chambers, Jr. I am the Paul Harris of the Triangle IOTAs, which is the Alpha Epsilon Omega alumni chapter of IOTA Phi Theta Fraternity Incorporated. And tonight, we have uh, our latest session in our law enforcement series, which we've been doing since January, which is what do you do if you are arrested? And so tonight we have two uh, North Carolina law enforcement officers and hopefully we'll be joined by a criminal defense attorney in a moment just to, to answer this question from both sides. So here's what we wanna do. We wanna treat this as a conversation. And so uh, I'm going to sort of introduce the question to our panel after they introduce themselves and we'll just get right to it. And so how we're doing this is if you guys can ask your questions in the chat, I will feed them to our panel. And again, we don't want this to be a lecture. We want this to be more of a conversation. And so if our guests can introduce themselves, we can get right into it. Hey, what's going on, everybody? My name is Brother Daniel Tyler. I'm also a police officer here in the state of North Carolina. Brother Dell Jackson. I'm an officer, been an officer for about six years in the state of North Carolina. All right. So as you can imagine, being arrested is not something you want to experience for any reason. And as you imagine, people can get arrested for any type of reason. Sometimes it's clearly a crime. Uh, sometimes it might be at the officer's discretion. Sometimes things happen. And, and so before we get to the actual arresting part, um, if we can start off by just talking about when you're, when you're dealing with a police officer or a sheriff's deputy, even in a, a tense situation, uh, what, is, how, how, what is the best way uh, regarding like tone, demeanor, things like that. Like what is the best way someone should interact with a, a police officer? Well, I think, uh, uh, I think if, you know, if you meet a police officer, uh, the way you should start the interaction off of dirt, if you're about to be placed under arrest is uh, definitely to comply. Um, comply without any physical force at all. Just let them go ahead and place you under arrest and then uh, don't resist at all. Do not resist arrest because then you get charged with resist, obstruct, delay. Um, and just carry out, just act, answer the questions they need you to answer them if, if you want. Uh, you don't have to. You have the right to uh, invoke the Fifth Amendment, which is your personal right to not incriminate yourself. So um, if they do ask questions, you can or cannot answer them. Um, as they also say, you can have a lawyer present uh, as they question you. Uh, but I would definitely, if, if I'm about to get arrested, I would definitely comply uh, to the full extent of the law. Now, as far as interaction before being arrested, I would say um, two ways. The way I'll go about it is just treat it as in, like I'm talking to a teacher, or I'm talking to uh, an older person of the family, treat them with respect, talk to them, don't do anything extra, don't do anything more or less, just be yourself. Um, the second way I would, would treat it as to talk to somebody like at your peer, just don't disrespect them or just don't go above and beyond, if that makes sense. And so let me ask you this, has there ever been a moment where either of you have considered uh, putting places someone in custody, but you didn't because of um, their tone, their actions, things along those lines? Yes, plenty of times. Um, honestly, if I'm talking to you, I know I might arrest you, but you're being cooperative and I have no no reason to go ahead and place you on arrest. I'm gonna go ahead and talk to you first, get your questions out of the way, get my questions out of the way before I even cuss on you. But if I get the feeling or your demeanor is coming off as aggressive or as in flight, um, 
then yes, we'll have to put handcuffs on there, handcuffs on before that happens. And the reason being, if I put handcuffs on you before you get to that, that point, less interaction will happen between me and you and everything like more likely goes smoothly. So there, there are certain instances where, uh, again, you might not get arrested. Now, of course, if it's a, a major crime or something serious that you're being accused of, then you might not just get it. You might, it, it might be what it be in that instance. But in a lot of situations, um, and just for context, I, has, I was a former newspaper crime reporter. And so I would show up to a lot of crime scenes and I've seen it myself where people will talk their way out of being arrested just because of their, their demeanor, being cooperative, things like that. But then at the same time, I've seen people talk themselves into being arrested just again, because of their tone and demeanor. And I get it. If you know a loved one has been killed, uh, emotions are very, very high. But um, like you said, demeanor is very, very important. So let's say the officer says, hey, you're, you're under arrest. What should you do? What shouldn't you do? Just so, comply with the officer's directives. That's what I would do. And explain it a little bit further. I would just say, as with everything going on right now, I wouldn't do anything. I wouldn't do any quite quick movements. Just listen to what the officer says. So he said, give you his left, your left hand, give you your left hand. Put your hands on the steering wheel, put your hands on the steering wheel. Put your hands on top of the hood, put your hands on top of the hood. Don't do anything extra. Um, if you have your phone and it starts ringing, just don't move it. You can let them officer know I have my phone right there and just go from there. Just listen to everything the officer is telling you. That way, everything can possibly go as smooth as possible. And so can someone, uh, I'll give you some, so some people in a situation where they think they're gonna be arrested, they may pull out their cell phone and start recording. And if they're being put in custody, um, what should they do or shouldn't do with their cell phone or something like that? So I had an instance where I was going to put somebody, place on somebody on arrest, and before I did that, they already bought the phone. They said, I'm going to start recording you. I told them it's fine. I don't have any problems being recorded because I do everything on the up and up, so I don't have any issues. Um, I, I, don't, I really don't care if you record. I actually want you to record um, just so you can be at, at mine. Now, if I do a little bit more feedback and I'm saying, oh, no, you can't be recorded and get high strung about it, then you're more likely to do something stupid and we're in the going to end up having use for us, which can be thrown out the way if you just listen to them and talk to them as a person. So, so the key thing here, uh, if I can summarize correctly, is to, um, I guess, like I've ever term, not overreact if you will, uh, if an officer decides to place you in the custody, it kind of is what it is at that point. And it's just best to just comply and follow directions. So let me ask you this, why, why would someone, uh, I'll rephrase, if it's that simple, then why do people resist? Why do people fight? Why do things get really bad? when an officer tries to arrest someone in some situation. Well, Stan, it's, it, I think it's more of, like you just said, I mean, like, why do people resist? You know, like if we're placing somebody in arrest, no one wants to get their their rights taken away from them. No one wants to be captive or held captive, held in captivity, you know? I mean, I think most people, they don't want to go to jail. Um, some people, they're willing to kill police officers before they go to jail, you know? And the sad part about it is, when these incidents get out of control, you know, we, we take a step back and we, we look at the entire incident. Um, they, they look at to see if the officers even had rights to be there in the first place. And then they go from how it happened to where they're at now, you know, but most people, they leave, they, they don't want to go to jails because no one wants, no one wants to have their rights taken away from, them. you know, I think it's just a, a simple thing of no one wants to go to jail. I mean, people are like, I'm not wrong. I'm, I'm going to stay right here and they're going to fight for what they believe in. So some of them do. Let's look at it like this way as well. You have people who are going to resist regardless. You have mm -hmm. officers who do not know how to talk to people and mm -hmm. put themselves in that situation. And then mm -hmm. you have people who are complying for for half of it. And then once they realize that they're in trouble, they freak out. Mm -hmm. so there's, this is a panic. 
Mm-hmm. So those are the three things that I normally see when situations don't go right. Mm-hmm. And actually, uh, I'm going to put a link in the, the chat in a moment because we kind of talked about this during our conversation last month regarding use of force. And one of the examples was a woman who's being placed under arrest. And once she realized she's being arrested, that's when she freaked out and attempted to run from the officer. And and so if you can walk us through, um, before I ask this question, so for those that are watching, uh, say hello in the chat. Don't be afraid to ask your questions in the chat. Uh, Jerome, I saw your question and we're going to get to your question in a moment. Um, But let me ask you this. So, and it sounds simple, if you will, but walk us through the process, if you will, of being arrested. Like what, when would an officer decide that someone needs to be taken into custody and sort of what happens from there? So normally officer officer will not put anybody in handcuffs unless they're being detained or being arrested. If they're being detained, then they investigate a crime and they feel like the person's gonna leave. They're being arrested, then the officer knows there has been a crime committed and is going to charge that person with that crime. So cuffs are not put on somebody just just for no, for no reason, right? And and I've used um, in custody and arrested interchangeably, but they're actually two different things. Mm-hmm. And so and so, all right. So you're you're placed in handcuffs. Um, you're being charged with a crime. What happens next? Um, once you're charged, you're transported for your first appearance to a, a magistrate, uh, some type of ju- some sort of judicial official for your first appearance, which you have to, which we have to take you in front of. Um, once you're taken to the magistrate, you either receive bond or you either get uh, confined to the court. I'm sorry, confined to the jail. Um, that's when most people they call a bail bondsman, or um, if they if they get a secured bond, they usually call a bail bondsman. If it's within their reasonable means for them to pay or they get an unsecured bond, which is a bond where you're not confined to the jail, but um, you still have to make your court date for the crime that you have committed. So an unsecured bond is basically when you sign yourself out of the jail and you promise to be in court. Normally, if you miss that court date, you will have a warrant for your arrest and the bond will normally be doubled of what it originally was. Yes. But you didn't have to pay anything. And so typically with an unsecured bond, if you're charged with a felony, uh, assault, murder, attempted murder, um, those type of things, typically you're likely not going to get a secured bond, correct? Yes. But yeah. there are some felonies that I have seen and I have talked with the magistrate because when I did arrest a person and talk with them and do my investigation, they were quite cooperative the whole time. And as long as you're quite cooperative with the officer, nine out of 10, they want to tell the magistrate exactly what's going on and explain to them how you were. And if you weren't being somebody that was irate or giving issues in more likely you get an unsecured bond, unless it's a very, very hard crime or a serious crime, I'd say. Gotcha. And so Jerome, um, Jerome in, in the chat, um, he mentioned that he's a, a former detention officer with over 20 years experience. Um, and unfortunately, Jerome, the way this is set up, we can't add you to the conversation. Uh, he wanted to talk about um, what to do and what not to do once you're in jail. And so I don't know if you if you guys can expand on that at all. So I've worked I've worked in a jail and I've actually taken people to jail in two different facilities, um, one in Raleigh and one in Gastonia. So they're a little bit different. Uh, when I worked in Raleigh, when we took them to jail, um, we actually booked them in. They went to a separate room where they were searched. They were searched by the detention officer. At that point in time, the officer gives them over to the detention center. So we're no longer in cut. They're no longer in our custody. They're in their custody. So they would get searched. They would take all their belongings, put it in a bag, and then it would be sent to the back room where it is set there until they actually bond out or until they leave the jail. Um, and from after they get searched by the detention officer, they'll go back and sit down. The officer will go ahead and uh, write the charges out and present them to the magistrate. And once they get the charges, they will actually come back and read the charges to the defendant, and then they would take them down to the um, to the magistrate, where the magistrate would actually ask them do they understand what they've been charged with, and then the magistrate would then set their bond secured, unsecured, um, and give them the bond amount and how to bond out. Um, 
no, an officer or a detention officer is not allowed to give a bondsman's number, but most of the time there are inmates there that have bondsmen's and you just talk with somebody there and they would give you one or sometimes I've seen cars there on the on the telephone. Um, in Gastonia, it's a little different. You take them in, they see the nurse, they get checked in. Um, if their blood pressure is good and everything looks fine, they would go ahead and get, they would pass the next point where actually you would go and make sure that um, they don't have any other warrants or anything else that I'll stand that you ain't know about. Um, then you'll get the paper from the, what do you call it, the repository. You will sign it, you read, your, uh, read the warrants or FTA to uh, the person. After that part, you'll take them to the magistrate where they would get the bond. And then after that part, then you would release your custody to the detention um, center. So it's a little different that way. But if they go to the um, to the nurse and their blood pressure is off or they have open wounds and they'll go to the hospital and also to it from there until the whole time until they're released, you know, do the whole process after that way. And so just to follow up on that, because you do have experience as a detention officer, uh, if you can talk about um, what are some things, and it might be the same as when interacting with an officer, um, what should and shouldn't you do if you end up in jail? So the main thing is act polite and properly because if you're if you're acting very irate and doing things you shouldn't be, you'll be put in a chair where you're full restraint. Basically, you have you can't do anything at all. Or the step underneath that would be you be placed into a holding cell where it's. Uh, a padded room and it's a little hole in, hole in the wall just in case you have to use the bathroom. You're placing there until you're released into the to the cells upstairs or you until you bond out. Um, but before that, you're really just sitting down in a, in, a, in a bench seat until you make your calls or until it's time for you to dress out. And then um, Jerome um, added, uh, then you have four hours to bond out um, before because I understand that you, at least I know this in, in Wake County, that you're in kind of like a holding cell, if you will, for a few hours. And if you can't um, bond out, that's when you are admitted, if you will, to the jail. And that's when you get the, the, the jail suit and you get put into a cell and all of that good stuff. Um, and then of course, Jerome mentioned, uh, listen to the detention officer, of course. So I think the, the takeaway here is your, your demeanor really determines sort of in part what happens to you and how you, how officers and detention officers uh, respond to you. Is that sort of pretty much the gist here? Yes, sir. Yep. All right. And, and so, um, and Jerome clarified, you dress out in a jumpsuit. And so that's typically like the, the orange jumpsuit in, in most places. Uh, something you don't want to wear, <laughs> even as a Halloween costume. So since this is a, a, a surprisingly fairly quick conversation, usually we have these conversations for uh, about an hour. And again, we had uh, another guest to, to join us, but apparently he wasn't able to make it. So is there anything in, uh, and for those watching, again, uh, if you guys have any questions, please post them in the chat. Again, this is, this is more so a conversation than a lecture. And, and so we want to ensure that you guys' questions are answered and that you come away learning something um, other than just hearing us talk. <laughs> so, um, so, okay, here we go. Here's another question. So. Michael asked, can officers set the demeanor for the traffic stop? Yes, I believe yeah. they do. I do too. I, I, I totally agree with, uh, with my brother. I, I, I think you, yes, the officer does set the temporary traffic stop. Um, I think that if, it, as an officer, you, you have to be respectful. Uh, you're going up to somebody, you don't know anything about them, but still you just, you should treat people the way you want to be treated. I know I do. So I go up and I, uh, I give them the greeting of the day. I say, hey, how you doing? Or good afternoon, good evening. Um, and I ask them, do you know why I pulled you over? Most people, they usually say no, or most people, they usually say yes, either or. And then I advise them why I pulled them over for, and, you know, and go from there. Um, but some people, they don't, they, some people, they're like, no, I didn't do any of that. And then I'm like, okay, 
And then, you know, I just explained to him, like, hey, this is the violation of law, and we'll just go from there. But, no, I think the officer does set the tone for a traffic stop, and the person does as well. So it takes, it takes both people to meet in the middle for it to go well. You know, quick random question. So I've had the pleasure, if you will, for being uh, pulled over for speeding. And, and so <laughs> when you pull over someone for speeding, um, you know they were speeding because you clocked them, and that's why you pulled them over. Does it really matter – in an instance like that, whether they admit to it or not right there, like, does that matter for most officers or for you two in particular? For me, no, because um, I'm radar certified, so I know how to use the radar and I know how to use my guesstimate. Um, however, if I'm coming to you and I'm explaining to you what's going on, because my, my greeting the other day is, um, hey, I'm Officer Jackson with the Gas County Police reason I put you over for speeding. You were going X amount and X amount is on you. Were you in a rush? Um, then they give me the answer there, and they're like, "Oh no, I wasn't speeding. I wasn't doing this." Uh, that point in time is like, okay, if you were going like ten over, then and it wasn't in traffic and every time of the day, I might be giving you a warning. But if you want to come off aggressive and very irate, yeah, you're gonna you're gonna hold the ticket. So once again, that comes by as far as my demeanor is cool, calm, and collected, and you're up top and very argumentative off top, then yes, your demeanor is going to end up giving you a ticket. And I've had somebody as well say, oh, okay, they were going 15 over, but they were going to the hospital to meet their, uh, their wife because my wife's having a baby. Okay, um, make sure everything's fine, make sure everything's like, good with your license, I'm seeing you anyway. I'm not going to be a tool for, for something that should be happy, a happy day in your life. Right. Right. But once again, this person did have doctors uh, had stuff in there. I can see he was going to the hospital. Right. So if you're going to say uh, I'm rushing to the ER, you got to have a verifiable story, pretty much. So um, Miles asked, you always see in the movies that you're given one free phone call once you're in jail. Uh, is that true or is it a myth? If it's true, why is that the case? So most of the time when you get into the jail, while the officer is doing their paperwork, you have access to a phone and you can call people from that phone, but it has to be local. To, um, yeah, it was local in Wake, in Wake County, it was local in Gaston. If you have somebody that's not local, then I don't know what to tell you. Uh, most of the time when officers book you in or you're with the detention officer, you're getting your stuff, they will give you a chance to write out some numbers. Or if you have, if they don't, you can just ask, can you write down some numbers and they'll give you the numbers to go ahead and make calls. Now, however, if you're drunk and you're being very belligerent and you can't stand up straight and you think you're gonna harm yourself some, somewhere below those lines, they're gonna push you into a holding cell and you're not gonna be able to make calls until you get sober. So, by the way, uh, you might know him, Del, uh, Jerome is Officer uh, Sergeant Hall from the weekend. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, he said the first time, it was like, who you talking about? Okay, cool, 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 cool. So, uh, Greatness, I love that name, by the way. Uh, she asks, uh, during a traffic stop, when an officer runs a license plate, how much information does the officer have about the citizen based on running the plate? Does this information create bias before the officer encounters the driver? For my system that we have for my department and the department before mine, when you run the plate, it just gives you either expired, uh, revoked or stolen, stolen license plate, it gives you that information. As far as like who it is, you have to actually go into their driver's license number and go to another system and see who that person is. But nine out of 10, if an officer is driving, that person is driving erratic, something like that. Or if it's just a normal traffic stop and they're at a stop line, then they have time to look up all that information, then they can. But most of the time it's actually after, after we get your ID. I've had a I've had a traffic stop where um so I ran the tag the guy came back and um he had he had a lot of uh, bad things in his history but no I don't think it, I think if you judge someone off their history I think that's I mean most people they say that's the prejudgmental factor but I've had the guy I mean he was cool calm and collected with me and I went I went back up there and I talked to him for a little bit and I asked him what made him change and he told me he's like yeah I used to do bad things but I, I changed because I wanted to. 
And he's like, I, and he said, I appreciate you treating me fairly because, you know, I've been stopped by police officers and they've been rude to me. But he said, you were really nice. And I said, well, I can't base you off your history. I mean, yeah, a couple of bad things, but no one's perfect. And, you know, we're all human beings. And he, he was really happy that I treated him like a human being that day. So I think that counts for something good. So yeah, some officers, they do judge you off your history, but I don't think you should be judged like that. I don't at all. So and truth be told, yeah. and truth be told, um, when we run somebody's tag, nine out of 10, we don't think that person's going to be in the car unless we get right beside them. Because how many people do you know drive a car that's not theirs or drive their spouse's car and it's not under their name? So mm -hmm. we don't really believe that pe people that's driving that car is, is their car. Mm -hmm. So once again, you drive run the tag, it doesn't come back to that person, it comes back to somebody else. So uh, Miles responded that he needs to have some 919 numbers and his back pocket. Just know your wife's number. <laughs> she'll <laughs> just just call your wife. She'll she'll take care of the rest. Trust me. <laughs> and and so, um, again, um, um, I spoke to our uh, third guest. If you guys saw me off to the side, and so hopefully he'll be joining us in a moment. Um, but. I guess in, in closing, when I can't stress this enough, I don't think any officer can stress this enough, but if you guys can again talk about the importance of demeanor and tone, even when the even when you know the officer is wrong because of something he or she is doing. Like if if you can guys reiterate. The, the value of sort of having a measured tone and demeanor when in a tense situation, in a potentially tense situation with an officer and you think you might be getting arrested. So I'm gonna say this, if you already think you're getting arrested and your demeanor is high and the officer is already high with you, it's not gonna end well. Um, just, it's been two situations that's happening within the last year to five years, actually going on forever, um, situations where they're both high and doesn't go good. Now, however, if you see, um, I'm trying to think of a situation that I, I've been in. I've been in a situation where this wasn't really just a traffic stop. It was more so of a domestic situation. Um, a 21 year old, caught her boyfriend with somebody with somebody else and she was home with the kid. She got there, she scratched up the girl's car and everything else like that. Her grandfather was with her and her sister was with her. And sister was, I think 14, 13. And her grandfather was like 80. Um, gave like 20 commands like to get them to calm down and they still was trying to fight the other people. Uh, ended up putting the grandfather in handcuffs and putting the daughter in handcuffs. And then the youngest child, she was the one sitting in the car still. So me personally, I'm able to kind of separate my feelings and everything that's going on. So I was able to actually calm down and talk to people as a person, the grandfather as a person, and he got him to calm down to let him realize that he's acting this way. His 13 year old daughter is gonna have to end up getting called by DSS for her to come get her granddaughter, I'm sorry, because there's nobody here to actually drive her back to her house. So a lot of people don't want DSS to get involved and DSS shit can get involved if the parents can actually take care of the kids or gang kids, so to say. So I got him to calm down, end up giving him a ticket instead of taking him to jail. So that's that's another instance where if you can calm down and talk to officers as a person, your demeanor is good, it can end up being a ticket instead of being arrested. It really just depends on the agency and the officer. Most times you can either, an uh, officer can talk to their sergeant and find with an arresting and giving citation. Because a lot of stuff you can't get citation for. A lot of, a lot of things are misdemeanors. You get a ticket mm -hmm. or court and be good versus going to jail. Especially with everything going on right now, officers don't like taking people to jail for no reason. Because I know if you work in Charlotte, you go take somebody to jail, you're in the jail for three or four hours every day. And that's too long. Um, a lot of officers don't want to do that, especially on officers, officers are humans too. So they have to they have to have meal time, they have to use the bathroom. So you gotta think of that way as well. And then the other girl, unfortunately, she was still our rate, so I didn't take her to jail. Um, so that's one situation. Have you ever have, have you had any at all there? Uh, yeah, I've, I've had to take um, I took a lot of people to jail, but um, I try to definitely use officer discretion with that. Um, like you said, you can have uh, you can call your sergeant and it's discretionary appointing your sergeant or supervisor to have that person arrested on the scene, depending on the crime that they have committed. 
So yeah, I've, I've had a couple situations, but uh, I try to definitely reason with people, but uh, your tone and demeanor definitely goes a long way. Um, if you're compliant from the get go and then once you get to the magistrate, we let him know, hey, he complied with us the whole time. The magistrate might give you an unsecured bond, but uh, if you're not, then we're gonna have to let him know, hey, we had to fight with this guy. He resisted arrest and we had to use physical force against him, you know, then it goes from there. And you're probably just gonna get confined to jail and stay there for a long time. And so I think that's a, a good way to look at it. And I, it's, it's, I understand that it's hard to think logically in a logical situation and to think rational in an irrational situation. But think of it this way. Let's say you, somebody is arrested for, I don't know, uh, burglary for like breaking through the evil. And the officer decides to um, arrest them and charge them with breaking to a vehicle. Which in the grand scheme of things, again, if that's your that's something you might be able to plead down. I am no attorney. There are no attorneys on this call. So do not take stand for it. But in a situation like that, that can be sort of reduced depending on your history and whatnot. But then if you decide to run, if you decide to assault the officer or something really bad happens, then your charges escalate to a felony. And that reduces your, your chances of the magistrate, the, uh, the judge in a trial going easy on you or getting reduced charges and things like that. Uh, and, and so, Again, cannot stress um, just having a, a keep a level head in, in those types of situations. And um, sort of run on cue, we have our our uh, third guest on the call is able to join us. Uh, thank you, Ryan, for joining us. If you're able to just introduce yourself briefly. Hi, my name is Ryan Stowe. I'm happy to be here. I am a criminal defense attorney in Salisbury, North Carolina. I'm happy to be here. Awesome, awesome. Happy to have you, yeah. bro. Thank, thank you for joining us. And, and so um, we spent a lot of time talking about uh, sort of being arrested, what you should and shouldn't do from a law enforcement officer. But, you know, when somebody goes into jail um, and they, they might, their first call might be to a bondsman, but depending on their charges, they might be calling someone like you. Sure. So, um, from your point of view, what should someone do and not do if they are arrested and being charged? Sure. So the first thing first, I don't think they should do, they should not do a lot of talking at all. Uh, their first call should be to a bondsman or a family member to be bonded out of jail. That's usually they're going to be the first priority. After that, they should limit whatever phone calls they make because it's always recorded. So they don't need to call baby mama, brother, none of that, and just say, oh, I just got arrested for stabbing somebody, whatever it is, they don't need to go into any details. Um, if they're being arrested for a DWI specifically, there's some things that they should and shouldn't do with that. Uh, but for the general speaking, they shouldn't talk to anybody. If they do call an attorney, they just need to say, hey, I'm charged with this crime, not go any details. What's your rate? Can you come see me? We can, so we can talk on a line that's not recorded. All right. But then the other thing, one other thing, they should not participate in any police interview at all. It's different if you have not been arrested yet, then you probably still shouldn't. But at least at that time, there is some benefit to that at times. But if you've already been arrested, you've already been charged, there's no benefit to talking to law enforcement at all. It can only incriminate yourself more. So uh, I got to mention this earlier, uh, but Ryan is along with being a criminal defense attorney, is also a member of Alpha Phi Alpha, Attorney Incorporated. So, Greek love here, Greek love here. Uh, we are all one big family. So thank you for that, Ryan. Uh, we do uh, have another question. Uh, and this is a good question, actually. Um, and I would like all three of you to chime in if possible. Is there such a thing as a citizen's arrest in North Carolina? If so, how does that work? I mean, I honestly don't know. 
I'll let you go first, Ryan. Uh, you know, it's funny because we were just talking about that earlier. I, and I, I hate if I tell you the wrong thing, but the safe answer is no, I would not do it. Um, but especially because what if you're wrong? You, you know, you might think you saw someone commit a crime and you didn't. And then now you're potentially false imprisonment or kidnapping or some assault or battery, some other tort claim. I say no. And I don't want to tell you the wrong thing because maybe there is, but I think there is some, I think there is at least some citizen's arrest if it's, if you think someone has committed, no, I'm wrong. No, other states, they do have it if, if someone has committed a felony in your presence. But if I'm not mistaken, North Carolina does not have a citizen's arrest at all. North Carolina has the law where you can protect yourself or a third party from imminent danger of someone else. Yes, you can stop that person from hurting that person. But I wouldn't just go in around if you see someone commit a crime and then you try to arrest them yourself. Uh, like you said, they can, you can be charged with kidnapping or false imprisonment. Um, you got some people over here putting on zip ties on people, which is uh, unlawful entertainment. And uh, you will find yourself in a situation where you might have to call Mr. Snow. Uh, <laughs> so I would highly suggest that you uh, look up the law before you know what you're doing and uh, definitely not go put your hands on people committing simple assaults. Um, I'm going to say this. Me personally, when I'm off duty, I'm, I'm a regular person. So if something happens, I'm going to be the best witness possible. Unless yeah. I actually have to help somebody to help their life. So I'm going to be the best with as possible. That's just me. The, the, mm -hmm. yeah. Although I don't think North Carolina has a citizen's arrest, I will say this, and I hate that I have to say it. Even if we do, I don't advise minorities to do it. <laughs> <laughs> but I don't, I'm pretty sure we don't have it, though. Yeah, yeah. Def definitely, definitely. <laughs> so I think the, the moral of the answer to this question is you're not Superman. <laughs> uh, and if you see something happening, you're like Dell said, be the best witness you can and call 911. <laughs> call call the officers in, in uniform. Because like Ryan said, if you're wrong, then you're opening yourself to a whole lot of trouble. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, Michael asks, so when stop, if you say I don't answer questions, is that legal you don't have to ask for anything that an officer asks you i will say this you do have to if he stops for a traffic violation you are driving you do have to id yourself because north carolina is a, an id state if you committed a traffic violation not if you're standing outside if you're committed a traffic violation or a crime you have to identify yourself to a law enforcement officer in the state of north carolina because if you do not you will be arrested or further detainment, but most likely arrest is going to occur for resisting, obstructing, and delaying the investigation of the officer. He actually stole all, every single last thing I was going to say. If you're walking down the street and you could do that, if you're driving, again, you, if you are the driver, you do have to at least uh, give an idea who you are or, or license in this situation. But um, while you don't have to answer any questions, you don't have to tell anybody where you're coming from or where you're going, none of that. However, depending on some of the questions that you're asked, again, you may be charged with resist, delay, and obstructing a public officer. Uh, that charge is totally discretionary, and I hate it because it's often overused, and then it's also not understood by people. Everyone thinks that resisting, delay, and obstructing means I resisted arrest, and that is not, it can mean that, but it can, can literally just mean you caused a delay in their investigation, or you obstructed them in some way, or even if you're if you're witnessing some law enforcement interaction and the officer says, hey, stand over there, and you say, no, I'm going to stand here and record, yes, it's legal to record, but because you didn't stand over there, you now have a resist, delay, and obstruct charge, potentially, if, if they feel as though you delayed them in any way and they're going to say you did. I'm going to tell you now, I don't, I don't charge that. Well, I'm saying I don't charge it. I have charged it, but very rarely because, I mean, it's a, to me, it's a cop-out. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it really depends on the officer, but... Like, like you said, once again, this goes to, uh, to the sense to the situation: Are you detained or are you free to go? So, mm -hmm. like I said, if you're not detained, mm -hmm. you don't have to answer anything. You don't even have to ID yourself. Not detained. Yeah. But if you're detained, that's when you have to ID yourself, and you don't have to ask any questions. So, really, go back to, the, to that situation. And and I agree with Ryan and and Dell when they when they say like uh, charge them just obstruct delay just single handedly like you said is a cop out. It's just not. A lot of people, they don't understand it, you know? That's why most departments are starting to, if you have ROD, you're going to have to have another secondary charge. Uh, I know most departments, they have that 
that type of policy. Like there's ROD, yeah, you can charge someone with that, but uh, when you go to court, you might want to have something else with it. You know, um, it was a disorderly conduct. What, what, why did he, how did he obstruct you? Uh, how did he delay your investigation? You know, uh, I know some detectives, they charge it during murder investigations when they have uh, family members who knew what happened, but they didn't tell them until they figured it out and also proved that they knew the whole time. And yeah, I could see that, but. It's, you know, it's like, like you said, Dale and, and Ryan, it's, it's, it's basically a cop out for, uh, for officers to make an arrest sometimes. <laughs> and also the thing about it goes, and in, in my experience as a crime reporter, I've seen this firsthand where, uh, again, back to what I was saying earlier about being at a scene and it's an emotionally charged scene and the relatives, you know, officer asks relatives to move and of course the relatives are upset, emotional, and they don't want to move. Um, again, like I said earlier, it's hard to be rational in irrational situations, but the idea is to sort of think about the bigger picture. Like, is, is me staying on my ground worth being in handcuffs? Even if I'm not arrested, just being detained is annoying. Nobody, nobody, wants, nobody wants to go through that. So, Again, just thinking of the bigger picture and um, and just something to keep in mind, there's always recourse. You know, there's there's people like Ryan, there's there's the, the court system, there's there's witnesses. So there's always recourse. Um, again, we've seen situations where uh, during the arrest, somebody gets out of hand, so like the situation gets out of hand, somebody gets killed. And if they just thought like, okay, even if I'm taken to jail. I can bond out, I can get an attorney, I can fight this and sort of win the war, if you will, instead of trying to win the battle. Uh, so again, that's something else to, to keep in mind. I, I in think you're exactly right, because when you're dealing with law enforcement in any way, the goal is to survive that encounter and not incriminate yourself. And you can fight all you want in court but at the time, even if you're exactly right, the time to say my rights are this and this and that, and it's not on that traffic stop or whatever it is. And some people will disagree with that, but I don't think, and I, and I hate it that way, but with the climate right now, the best thing to do is just to stay silent and you know you can fight it in court. I think that's, I think you're right. You can win the war there and, and try to win a battle on the street. And you know what, you, you hit the point, Ryan, and not to be preaching, but I'm gonna be preaching a little bit. It's, Nowadays, uh, just to be honest, just being a black male is challenging, whether you wear a badge or not. <laughs> just, just being like, I've, we know instances where off-duty police officers have gotten assaulted and hurt just because they're black men. So, especially being a black male, and I'm not going to rehash what's going on. We all know what's going on. And we hear it, it seems like an incident every month these days and and so again what to do when you're arrested uh here's an idea think about the bigger picture think about like like uh ryan said you want to go home you know officers are not intentionally trying to keep people from going home uh and so when you're in a situation the officer wants to go home you want to go home and and so it's just being able to make that easier for everyone. Again, there's recourse, there's attorneys, there's evidence, there's a, a trial. So just think of the bigger picture. Uh, even when you are in, again, in, in a situation, even if you think you're right, as Ryan said, being on the side of the road or being at a crime scene is not the time to litigate your case. <laughs> That's not the time to uh, recite what little bit about the law you may know. So, um, so we get more. Oh, okay. No, I'm saying little, little law you know might be wrong as well. Mm -hmm. I'm just making sure you, <coughs> you be quiet is the best thing to do. Right, right. Be, leave, leave the expert stuff up to the experts and let them figure it out. Like, I'm not an engineer, so I'm not trying to tell you how to build a bridge. You know, that actually comes up every now and then um, because there's a thing that you can resist an unlawful arrest. And people ask me about it all the time. And it's like, well, how do you know it was unlawful? And even if it was unlawful, you you might get 
hurt seriously hurt in the process of you resisting what what might have been unlawful or not and so uh, i don't know why people tend to do that though but yes that's a thing as well right again ryan's a professional people like ryan know the law uh so again trust your experts uh so uh, miles have a question if arrested what are my rights to record all or part of him getting arrested on my cell phone can the police do anything with my video or audio recording once they confiscate my cell phone good question that is a good question yeah well, the only, only thing i'm gonna do is cut your phone off as i get yeah. arrested because i'm not going through your pro your property your, i'm not yeah. going through your property uh, that makes the, sense. Only thing, the only thing that um if we even if we had to go through your phone, we went to go get a search warrant. Uh, we can't intrude your privacy. Uh, we went to go get a search warrant through a judge, and we have to have probable cause to even go through your phone in the first place. So but that's why most of us we just turn just turn a person's phone off and we put it in their bag with all their other belongings, and then we keep it with that person. Um, usually, when I take someone's phone, I just put it. If it's not, if it has nothing to do with my investigation, I go ahead and turn their phone off for them. I, or um, I have them get all the numbers that they need out for like their family members for, some, for someone for them to call and I just go ahead and place it in their pocket or with their belongings. Uh, but no, we don't go through no one's phone. You're not supposed to. So um, no, it's, you're, uh, they have a search warrant because that's uh, your privacy. Right. Um, so I, you're not going to be able to record your own arrest because you're going to be in handcuffs. It's just not going to be a thing. Now, if you're recording someone else, you can record it all day long, as long as you're not interfering with their investigation or that process. Um, and they're exactly correct. You, they need a search warrant. So you should never, ever give your phone passcode, uh, any of that. I've seen some cases where an officer will use your fingerprint. They should not do that. That is, Ill I believe that's illegal. I think they're still litigating that in Supreme Court, and whether they can just take your phone forcibly use your phone, your phone, your, your uh, thumb for later on. I don't know. But otherwise, you should never give your passcode out, especially if it's a drug related crime. All right. Uh, Michael asked, um, and I think Ryan, this is before, I think it was before you came on when we were talking about sort of, no, no never mind, we're here. <laughs> we're going on IDs. I <laughs> did to show your ID, you were here, sorry. Um, Michael asks, are you saying regardless of the situation, he must identify himself. Is he detained or not detained? That's 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 the situation. Um, so, Michael, if you can hear hear us, you can clarify regarding with your question: Are you being detained or no? Um, and then Matt said, "I notice when you give your ID and you do not say anything, they don't bother you." Now that kind of goes back to sort of my point earlier about demeanor and sometimes it's just, it's just better to cooperate than to stand your ground uh michael said um not detained so does he so regardless of the situation if he is not detained must he still identify himself no no same thing with a traffic stop. If you're the passenger of the seat of the car and I pull you up for speeding, that's all I have. All I need is a driver's ID. I can ask for your ID, it's up to you if you want to give it to me or not. Mm -hmm. But then, okay, so to take a little bit further, what if the person doesn't give you their ID? I can't can do you, anything. Oh, yeah. They're the passenger, yeah. I can't do anything about it. Even if they're the driver? Yeah, if they're the driver. driver, I need the ID. Yeah, I need, I need your ID. Or you'll go to jail for obstruction of justice. But if um, just uh, he's saying great information, so just to, just to clarify. But then also, if you're standing on the corner or you're just like standing somewhere, and an officer just walks up to you and asks for um, their your ID, they don't have to do that. No. Nope. It, and as we covered, like in our last segments of uh, what to do if you're detained, if an officer conducts a voluntary encounter, which is like when they walk up to you, if you're standing on a corner or outside, if you're running and they're just coming up to you, which is a voluntary encounter, you don't identify yourself. You don't have to stop and talk to the police at all either. Um, as long as you feel that you're reasonably free to leave, then you have not been detained. Now, if they say, hey, come here and uh, stand right here and do not move, then you are detained. 
then uh, you will have to go ahead and ID, but they better have a type of crime they're going to either charge you with or possibly believe that a crime has been committed in that area. So. All right. So uh, again, everyone, so as we've been doing so far, if you can ask your questions in the chat, and I will feed them to our esteemed panel here. But if- and, and, but, something that's to add to the yeah, previous. So say if I do pull you over for speeding and I smear marijuana or I see alcohol open container in the car and I happen to end up getting you out of the car for voluntary. So me personally, I'm always at. So if, if I smear marijuana, I'm asking to search your car. You tell me, yes, I'm going to take out the car. I'm going to search you. Now, if I see marijuana in the car, I'm going to go ahead and search both individuals because I don't know who whose it is. And I'm going to ask for your uh, passion ID. Most, nine out of 10, I'm actually in a, in a way to act where I can get it to you, get it from you without taking it from you and making sense. I'm a, per I'm a people person. I want to make sure that I'm charging the correct person. Um, I get it that way. And as I'm searching a car, if it's voluntary, at any point in time, you're supposed to be able to see your car and tell me to stop or if I can keep going from there. Now, if I say, if I see marijuana in the car at that point in time, then I'm keep searching. You know, it's not voluntary anymore. It's, it's a crime. So oh. if you ask my idea on that part of the time, I would say yes, because they're investigating the crime. So, so Ryan, in, in a situation like that, what would you, from a legal point of view, what would you advise someone if if we're trying, uh, given their, their ID, if they're not being investigated for a crime versus if they are being investigated for a crime? So, uh, yes, yeah, pretty, pretty much the same thing. If they're being investigated for a crime and you have to give your ID, and if you don't, you're going to be charged with resisting, laying obstruct. Now, um, and to, to kind of a larger issue with what, Jack, with what Dell's saying is, uh, in terms of, you know, searches, you should never, ever consent to a search. I don't care if you only have, if you don't have anything in your car at all, and you know you don't, because one, you could be wrong. Two, you never know what someone has left in your car, especially passengers in the backseat. I know I don't, I never sit back there. I would never know what's in there. And then three, you don't know that, and I, I hate to say it, but you don't know that an officer's not going to plant something. So I never suggest those. Um, and some people say, well, maybe it looks like I'm guilty if I don't. And it does not. It makes you look like you're smart. Um, specifically in terms of marijuana searches, though, uh, the odor of marijuana in most cases is not going to be enough for probable cause because it could have been hemp, which is legal. And so a lot of times those searches are in, end up getting suppressed if the lawyer argues that correctly in court. So even if you do get your car searched because the officer smelled marijuana or a dog sniffed, whatever you had may still go away if you don't admit to it being marijuana. So again, you should you know, not talk too much, but a lot of times they're not gonna test small amounts to determine how much THC it has, which is the, the active component of marijuana and any kind of cannabis flower that makes it between marijuana and whatever else it could be. So Miles asks uh, a question and I'm gonna take first crack at it because I, de I deal with this. I dealt with this a lot when I was a reporter. Uh, the question is, are arrests a public record, even if not convicted? If yes, what info is available and for how long? The short answer is yes. If you are charged with a crime in the state of North Carolina, it is public record. And so you may ask, how is a public record stand? Well, uh, some counties do a better job of this than others, but uh, county jails uh, on their websites have a log of people that have been uh, detained. And, and so, it's usually your name. Um, I think it has your DLB, might have your home address. Um, it definitely has your charges and it has your bond, if you have one, and your court date. So anyone can like, so I live in Durham County. So I can go to the Durham County Jail website and I can search a particular name. I can search within a particular time frame, but that information is public in one way. Uh, another way, is if you want to put in the legwork, you can go to the courthouse uh, and there are computer terminals that are open to the public and you can look up people. And again, the, the same information that's on the jail site um, is in that system. I think it's a little bit more information. It might have like your, your, um, your uh, court history and, and things like that and all of your past charges. So if that wasn't your first arrest, all of your arrests in the state of North Carolina 
are, are going to appear. Now, I know there are places where you can pay and they'll do a nationwide criminal search. Uh, but if you don't have the kind of money and you know somebody was arrested in Tennessee, uh, say three years ago, if you're not going to like pay a service, you might have to actually drive to Tennessee to that county courthouse to, to look it up. Uh, what else? What else? What other ways? Um, if your case goes to trial, uh, there is paperwork that is public. Um, your arrest warrant, if, if there is a warrant, um, that's public. Uh, oh, the police report as well. So um, if a police report is generated, that is public. Now, if it's an active investigation, more than likely it's going to be uh, redacted in some way, shape or form. I've seen reports where, where you describe sort of what happened, the whole thing is blank. And I'm like, wait a minute, someone was killed. <laughs> I know something happened because somebody was arrested for murder. Um, but that information is often blank until the, the trial or the case has been adjudicated. Uh, if your arrest involved a warrant, a search warrant, uh, that's public. I can't tell you how many times I've looked at search warrant and those are very, very interesting. And what the interesting part about search warrants is that an officer or the detective in most cases has to outline their entire case because the point is you have to convince a judge to approve them searching your home, your vehicle, your car, whatever the case may be. So everything about that case for the most part is right in that search warrant. And so I'm trying to think, um, are there any other ways that your arrest is, and of course, oh, oh boy, I've had this happen. Let's say your arrest makes the news. Yeah, that happens. So I've had, and this is a question I've dealt with as a news manager. So I'll have someone who will call the newsroom and they will say, hey, um, I was found not guilty or my case was thrown out can you remove the story of my arrest from your website? And so the short answer is gonna be no, because the arrest did happen. You know, there, there, were, there were nothing, there was nothing um, not factual in the story because you were arrested, you were charged with a crime. Um, and the point of the story wasn't whether you were found guilty or not. The point of the story was you were arrested and charged with this crime. Now, in my experience, I've told, um, because honestly, in a newsroom, I'm usually handling like a million different things. I'm not gonna have time to look up your case. And uh, because again, to find out if something was uh, adjudicated or um, a case was thrown out or something like that, I would have to either call the courthouse or go to the courthouse. Uh, and so what I typically say is, we need something from your lawyer saying that your case was cleared. Uh, we'll get that letter and we'll consider it. Uh, I can tell you that no one has ever, I've never gotten anything from an attorney about, <laughs> you know, us removing their, their story from the website. And I'm sincere about it. Like if I get the letter, I will consider removing the story from the website um, because I understand even if you were found not guilty, people do a background check on you. That still comes up. You're gonna have a hard time finding a job and things like that. So, oh, oh, another way your arrest is, is public. I can't bring me back to my crime days. Um, there in North Carolina, there is a publication called The Slammer. And what The Slammer does is they publish jail, jail mug shots. Um, in North Carolina, as of today, because I know there are efforts to not make this public record, um, but as of today, your mugshot, your jail mugshot is public information in the state of North Carolina. If you are arrested in the state of North Carolina, anybody can call the jail and get a copy of your mugshot. And so the slammer publishes mugshots. Um, and then there are some news websites, I know WRAL does this once upon a time, I don't know if they still do it, where there is a feed <laughs> of 
of um, mugshots from the Wake County Jail. And, and so at WRL, I was a web editor. I can tell you that page was the most visited page on our website pretty much every day. So there are multiple ways that your arrest is made public. Um, gentlemen, I don't know if there's anything I'm missing. I think I pretty much covered it all. There's two things that um, you, you uh, didn't touch on that the question the person asked. Um, it's on your record and it's public forever until you expunge it. That's pretty, there's no like seven year fall off period or anything like that. There are some websites that you can pay to take your stuff down they'll do it, they're really spammy, but they'll do it if you pay. And then the last thing is there is a current bill that's in a state legislator that would limit how public uh, your arrest records are. I don't know if it'll pass or not, but there is at least a bill for that. Right. But and like, why you, hit, you hit it, you answered everything. Cause, cause this was my life. <laughs> as a crime reporter, like I go through these every, every day. Um, and I believe with that bill, it would, um, it would limit Sort of information, arrest information that's released regarding, uh, I believe, police officers and other public officials, things like that. But, you know, I, I've covered stories where a police officer was arrested and charged with a crime. And typically that information is redacted for safety reasons uh, on the, the officer's part. So, uh, this is great information. I can only imagine trying to clear your name or job search after an arrest, even if vindicated of charges. Absolutely true, Miles. And so sometimes I know that on, on job applications, they'll say, hey, have you ever been arrested or have you ever been convicted of a crime? Um, I can't tell you whether to be honest with that or not, but I'll tell you this, it's better to, just with anything, it's better be up front then for you to get something and then for someone later on to say, oh, you lied by omission. And because of that, we're gonna have to fire you or whatever, whatever the case may be. So um, this has been a, a good, good conversation. I greatly appreciate um, everyone listening for joining us. And I greatly appreciate you three gentlemen for uh, taking your time and sharing your knowledge and experiences. So is there anything that you guys would like to say in closing? Just listen and try not to be too much, too emotional when things happen. And if officers are in the wrong, call a lawyer, sue them, sue the department. That's the best thing to do. Just be smart, be safe, and like Ryan and my brother Dell, Stan said, it's not the time to argue on the side of the road. It's not. Too much bad stuff's already happened. We don't want it to happen to you. So just let things take their course, and you'll have your day in court. I agree. I think that says it all. Just um, stay silent. Only answer what is asked that you have to answer. Don't incriminate yourself. Um, I hate it, but politeness does go a long way being cooperative in that sense because that can get you a lower bond. But other than that, um, that that's it. That's all you need to do. And uh, last, as I've said before, think with the big picture. Um, as Dan and Dale have said, um, and Ryan have said, courtesy can get you a lot further <laughs> than you think. And again, you and as Ryan said, you'll have your day in court. So everyone, thank you. Um, again, we've been doing these monthly conversations since January. And in the chat, I just put a link to our uh, previous workshops. And tonight's conversation will be on uh, that same, in that same link within the next 24 hours to share with your friends, with your family, because this information, just knowing how things work, uh, it's very, very important, crucial, especially given with what's been going on. Um, it's hard to, there are some situations where it's hard to, um, or where you can, the humanity is removed from the situation. 
you know, an officer might not look at someone as human, somebody might not look at an officer as human. And so through these conversations, we hope to sort of bridge the gap so that not only officers understand sort of what you guys think, but you guys also understand how officers think and what they go through. Because at the end of the day, everyone wants to go home. And, and, you, and we also want to sort of build uh, these bridges. And so, you know, the police wants to, we all want to trust each other. And so these conversations play a small part in doing that. So thank you everyone for your participation. And um, we will share more information on next month's conversation. So thank you everyone. Have a great night, stay safe. And, oh, because I work in healthcare now, uh, if you haven't gotten vaccinated, please get vaccinated. <laughs> uh, and But still, wear your mask, stay six feet, wash your hands, and I hope to have a fun summer because if you're like me, I need to get back on the airplane. I've been on an airplane over a year. So uh, have a good night, stay safe, and we will talk to you guys soon. And I think you're off. Let me just make sure. There's a 10 second, there's a 10 second delay between the Zoom